Hi everybody, this is a supplemental video which accompanies the dream video lecture and relates to the states of consciousness topic that we're talking about here, at least in relation to chip to sleep and dreams. And this will concentrate more on uh, sleep. Uh, the other lecture concentrates on dreams. And so um, while other methods have been used to study uh, sleep, uh, this has been the main method is EEG. Uh, quite simply, what these are are little electrodes. Those are the little things that are contacting uh, that person's head and face, and it reads uh, basically some rough electrical activity that's going on in the brain. Uh, you might see some old pictures of this where uh, there's individual contact points, and then they're placed individually. Nowadays, they use this uh, skull cap. It's much easier. You can just do the skull cap. It helps place the things right away. Um, it's a little bit quicker. So uh, basically what you have is uh, conduct points and those conduct points uh, probably have some sort of conductor on it to help pick up the electrical activity. And then you see that little machine in the back there that uh, reads the electrical activity. And these EGs are a little bit rough in some ways. Uh, in terms of sleep research, they often talk about two types of brain waves uh, that are being picked up during sleep during, for the EEG. One is uh, alpha waves, and the other is beta. And so alpha is on top there, and they call them synchronous. Uh, basically, you can just sort of say that there's you know there's large patterns of waves, and they look uh, pretty even. And this is just basically your brain is calm. So you can just think of the alpha waves as measuring your brain when it's relatively calm and it's these alpha uh, waves. And then uh, beta waves are uh, desynchronous. So they're desynchronous because they're all over the place. You can see them in contrast to A. They're up and down all over the place and they're also very um, quick and active. There's lots of peaks and valleys there versus the alpha waves. And so the beta waves are meant to sort of um, show that there's a lot of stuff going on in our brains. So typically what's happening here is, um, you know, during our waking times, for example, uh, lots of different parts of our brain are active and would lead to sort of this um, desynchronous beta waves because different things are active at different times, and so there's peaks for this, there's peaks for that, there's peaks for this. Um, so there's a lot more activity too. So whereas the alpha waves, which is on top there, are calm and kind of resting, the beta waves are more um, chaotic and you're doing a lot of thinking. Um, so the sleep research, uh, how they define different stages of sleep often are through these waves, whether we're mainly having alpha waves or beta waves. Uh, there's some other types of waves we'll talk about, but um, that's the basic distinction I want you to know before we move forward. And essentially, uh, research on sleep, you know, using the EEG uh, has sort of said that there's five stages of sleep. And it's a little bit confusing because the first stage is actually being awake. So when we get to sleep stages later, you'll see there's only four they're counting being awake as one of the stages of sleep. Uh, part of that, I believe, is that they want to highlight that with these different states of consciousness, <clears throat> there's a lot of, uh, lots of overlap. So it's not uh, so clear cut between the, the stages of consciousness. And so therefore they put waking as sort of a stage of sleep because uh, in essence, it's not necessarily different from some of the stages of sleep. So the, the first stage of sleep beyond being awake is stage one. And here you see it says R N R E M. So that just basically says it's uh, non-REM sleep. So it's a little bit confusing, uh, but basically in terms of the four stages of sleep beyond being awake, uh, three of them are non-REM and one's REM. 
that's when we have our dreams. So it's a little bit weird to have all of these non-REM being counted, but just know that there's no dreams going on here. REM stands for rapid eye movement. Uh, rapid eye movement is linked to us having dreams, and there's, again, only one stage that we'll talk about later of sleep that has uh, REM type sleep. So stage one is quite simple. It's just kind of a transition between being asleep and, I should say, being awake and being asleep. So you're just kind of falling asleep here. And again, uh, this is why they include waking as part of the stages of sleep, because uh, there's not necessarily clear-cut distinctions in these states of consciousness, if you will. Uh, so it talks about uh, theta activity. So basically, this is just saying that, um, at least in terms of our, our cortex, uh, the activity is becoming synchronous, so it's those alpha waves, which we talked about here. So it's starting to become restful in terms of your brain activity. And then um, you could have these things called hypnic jerks during this time where your muscles contract and then they relax. And basically it takes about 10 minutes for this uh, stage of sleep, for that transition from being awake to starting to go to sleep. I know you might be thinking, well, I know it takes me longer than 10 minutes to get to sleep. Well, that's because you're awake. So if you're in bed and you're in bed for 40 minutes before you start falling asleep, uh, that's not stage one. You're, you're awake. Um, it's only until you get into the uh, stage one where you start falling asleep. Well, it takes about 10 minutes if you're not uh, disrupted. Then stage two in terms of sleep beyond being awake it's also non-REM, so no dreams are going on during this time. So in stage two, there's this stuff called um, theta activity. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So basically, the way your brain waves are becoming a little bit more relaxed. Uh, they have these things called sleep spindles. It's just kind of short bursts of electrical activity um, in your brain. And that seems to be related to sort of consolidating uh, memories from the day. They also have this thing called K-complexes. Um, there's kind of sharp waveforms, they call it. This is basically peaks in that EEG reading. Uh, and it's kind of a precursor to a delta waves, which is coming in the next stage of sleep. So this is sort of a transition. So stage one was a transition from wakefulness to sleep. And stage two here is a transition from uh, stage one, which is relatively light, you're just falling asleep, to some really deep sleep in stage three. So there's a bit of a transition stage also. And roughly it takes about uh, 15 minutes, roughly, uh, for stage two to go through. And uh, in stage two, uh, if you wake up somebody who's in stage two of sleep, they often will deny that they weren't asleep. Uh, I'm sure you've, you've experienced this in the past. Um, you know, maybe some people are trying to stay up for some reason. Maybe it's New Year's when you're a kid. I can remember this uh, dramatically, especially with my younger siblings. Uh, my my dad had a rule that if you fell asleep, you had to go to bed, and therefore you would miss New Year's. <laughs> I, don't, I don't necessarily understand that reasoning, but um, so everybody's trying to struggle to stay up to um, have the New Year's rung in, if you will. And uh, my younger siblings almost invariably would fall asleep when we were, you know, kids. And um, you'd wake them up and they would vehemently deny that they were sleeping. Um, or you might know some adults that you know this, that, like you're, you're with them or something like that. They're, they're clearly sleeping, but you wake them up and they're like, I wasn't asleep. What are you talking about? They were probably in stage two. Uh, consciously, they weren't aware that they're sleeping, uh, but you look at them and it's clear that they're sleeping. Uh, but in terms of their consciousness, it's something that hasn't soaked in yet, if you will, um, because it's a lighter stage of sleep. So again, uh, stage two is this transition from just falling asleep in stage one to a very deep sleep. So stage three, uh, beyond wakefulness. So stage three of sleep which is also uh, not REM, so no dreams are going on. This is the deepest sleep. This is the deepest sleep you have. I think people often think dreams are the deepest sleep, but it's not. Uh, stage three is the deepest sleep in terms of uh, a state of consciousness. And here you have what's called slow wave sleep. Um, so if you think about the alpha brain activity being really calm, this is the most calm it gets is during slow wave sleep. 
Uh, so that's where these um, delta waves come in. You don't need to know uh, that specifically, but that's what delta, delta waves are, are basically indicating this real sort of deep, calm state of your mind. And it basically lasts an hour, at least in terms of the sleep cycle. Um, in terms of if you get eight hours of sleep a night, you should probably have, you know, three or four of these stage threes happen to you. Uh, and we know it's a really deep sleep also because if you try to wake somebody up in this stage, uh, it's really hard to wake them up and they're very groggy. Um, so we've all had the experience, right, where we've been woken up, but we, we really are out of it. Uh, it takes us a while to, to wake up. Uh, you were probably in stage three when that happened. And then uh, the last stage of sleep is uh, REM. Uh, so this is where we dream. So basically, it starts roughly about 90 minutes after we start sleeping. And what's interesting about REM sleep is it's different from stage one, two, and three. So stage one, two, and three uh, mainly are beta waves. I'm sorry, al alpha waves. Uh, alpha waves. So stage one, two, and three have alpha waves, which are the calm brain activity. REM sleep is not calm. It's beta. It's the, the chaotic, desynchronous brain activity, uh, which is very much how our brain looks when we're awake and we're alert. Uh, what does that mean? It means that when we're dreaming, there's lots of different parts of our brain that are being activated. And in many ways, that uh, brain activity, if we take that as an indicator of state of consciousness, is much closer to being awake and alert than the other stages of sleep. Sleep stage one through three is alpha, very calm. REM sleep is very chaotic, beta waves. So REM sleep looks a lot, in terms of our brain activity, looks a lot more like when we're awake and alert versus when we are in other stages of sleep. And um, it's a pretty abrupt change too. So when we go from stage three to REM sleep, it's very quick. It's very abrupt change from alpha waves to beta waves. So REM sleep, rapid eye movement. Uh, our muscle tone is paralyzed, so we don't move. Uh, there is a um, disorder. Um, I think it's called REM sleep disorder, I believe. Um, people who actually don't have the loss of muscle tone and movement and actually, um, in essence, act out their dreams uh, they aren't paralyzed. They get up and they act out their dreams. Uh, it's pretty rare. Uh, I think it would be relatively dangerous, perhaps, for the person uh, in terms of safety. Um, and so I think that tends to be treated uh, pretty quickly. I think they, they treat it through tranquilizers. They're basically, they're trying to <laughs> inactivate your muscles um, during that time if it's not naturally there. So this is where we um, have dreams. And we talked about dreams quite a bit in the other lecture. And it's easy to wake somebody up in REM sleep. It says with meaningful stimuli. So meaningful stimuli means like somebody talking to you or maybe somebody moving you, um, that type of stuff. And so um, it's not like sort of background noise. It's actually something directed towards you. Uh, you're a lot easier to wake up versus stage three. We talked quite a bit about this in the uh, dream lecture, but let's just review it. So um, again, the brain activity is beta waves during REM sleep. Uh, the research also shows when we look at more um, fMRI, so uh, basically it's taking a reading millisecond by millisecond of um, it's flow of various things like iron, but basically it's, it's measuring your blood flow in your brain. So um, we can see where the blood goes in your brain. It's called activation. So if more blood goes to a part of your brain, it's called activation. If less blood goes there, it's called deactivation. So if there's blood flow and it's activated, it means that that part of your brain is active and doing things. If it's deactivated, the blood flow goes away from it and you, you basically shut it down for now. And so, um, uh, we talked also about the, oh, I'm sorry. So in, with the fMRI um, readings, we know that our, our visual cortex is quite um, activated. Uh, just kind of 
know that uh, the difference between these parts, you don't have to know the extra stride and all these other things. It's a little bit more about uh, processing of visual images. Um, it's actually in the, it's actually kind of in the back part of your brain, back part of your cortex. When I say back, um, not the front part where your eyes are, but where the back of your head is. Um, but not much in the um, thinking part of it, which is the prefrontal cortex and the visual cortex, the primary visual cortex, which is more about the processing of the images. So it's really about uh, basically being bombarded by images. Um, and we probably all have had that experience in our dreams, that are very, very visual and we're kind of bombarded by visual images. And sometimes it's hard to, to process all of those um, in terms of thinking about them. Uh, so that's what this is saying in the first bullet point. Uh, we also know from the lecture on dreams that our limbic system is activated. So um, our dreams are, are rough visual stuff. That's the first bullet point. Second, they're emotional. It has to do with our limbic system. Um, dopamine might be involved. So I talked about that in the dream lectures. Um, so our, our dreams can kind of be um, crazy and strange. Uh, that might be related to the dopamine effect. Uh, lucid dreaming. Um, so lucid dreaming, at least in terms of biology of sleep, is referred to mainly as uh, being aware that you're sleeping. Um, so some, some research suggests that maybe the prefrontal cortex, which is normally uh, deactivated up here, this first point, uh, for most people, maybe for some people, the prefrontal cortex is more activated and can lead to lucid dreaming. Uh, the rapid eye movements might be related to the visual aspects of our um, dreams and of our brain being uh, active in terms of that part of our brain. Again, it's the rough images, that part of the brain is what's active. Uh, it's actually that part of the brain uh, that's active in terms of the visual stuff during dreams is actually the, the point of first processing of visual information. So we get visual information from our eyes and all of that stuff from our retinas um, go to this part of the brain first. Um, so it's basically used to get all this bombarded imagery uh, then it gets sent forward. It gets sent forward to the uh, primary visual cortex, which is a little bit towards the front of your head, uh, and the prefrontal cortex, which helps try to make sense of visual images. So uh, what's really interesting is that, again, our dreams are very visual, but uh, we're not thinking a lot about them. It's like being bombarded by a bunch of visual images. That's what the brain research suggests. And what's interesting about the rapid eye movements is um, it's what they call saccadic. Um, I'll show you how that's spelled in a second. Uh, so I put that down there. So there's a couple of uh, saccadic. So those are the rapid eye movements. So uh, just real simply in terms of our eye movements and processing of visual stimuli, uh, we have th essentially three types of eye movements. One is really concentrated. So where you're looking directly at something and you're focused on that, uh, that's very um, high acuity, which means we can see well when we're doing that. Um, then we also have a second type of eye movement, which is tracking eye movement. So you can just think about <clears throat> you know, watching somebody walk or watching a car drive by. We're using tracking movements. And so our eyes are moving and our heads are moving, uh, but it's relatively slow. Um, it's not as good as that straight on focusing on something in terms of acuity, being able to see things, but it's not so bad. Uh, the third type of eye movement is this type of eye movement, which is saccadic. So if we um, quickly turn and look at something or quickly move our eyes to look at something, those are saccadic movements. It's really quick and kind of herky-jerky. Those are the <clears throat> type of eye movements that we're having during uh, REM sleep. And so, um, that's stuff that's the least amount of acuity. So it's really hard to see things well when your eyes are moving so fast. So um, it's kind of interesting that it's saccadic eye movements where it's the lowest amount of acuity. Um, maybe it's related to this thing that um, it's the back part of our visual cortex that's being activated, which is kind of the primary 
place where we first get visual images. So when we get visual images, we get all sorts of stimuli, and so it gets bombarded by that part of the brain. So maybe because we're being bombarded by a bunch of visual stimuli, it's the saccadic eye movements. Uh, we're not really thinking deeply about it. We're not processing it in the front part of our brain. So uh, the saccadic eye movements probably indicate that type of visual stimuli and visual processing. And basically, um, we know that the brain mechanisms are similar in REM sleep during dreams as in uh, waking life. So for one, it's the beta brain activities. A lot of parts of our brain are active during REM sleep. And then uh, we also know from our dreams lecture that the content of our dreams often reflect our daily concerns, our daily stresses, our daily everyday problems we're having, um, or relationships that we're having with people, etc. cetera. Uh, so we know that um, these states of consciousness, again, there's not a clear cut between them because we can argue both in terms of the brain activity and also in terms of what we're thinking about. Uh, there's lots of connections between REM sleep and everyday waking up uh, state of consciousness. Oh, just an interesting little tidbit. Um, dolphins, when they sleep, uh, their two hemispheres are, of their brain are separate. So their left hemisphere and their right hemisphere. If you look at this, um, when they're in slow wave sleep on the right, slow wave sleep are these nice little synchronous calm waves, their uh, left side of the brain's awake. And then vice versa, when the left side is in slow wave sleep, the right side's awake. Uh, this is a really interesting adaptation. People think it's probably because uh, dolphins and their evolutionary past need to be um, always vigilant. And so one part of their brain always needs to be awake. Um, so this is something interesting about dolphins. So um, slow wave sleep is very important. So that's stage three. <clears throat> uh, this is really seems to be when your brain is resting the most. And the research uh, suggests that it's really related to um, learning, especially learning information. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, the research also suggests that uh, this is a part of sleep that promotes brain development. So you always heard probably it's really important, especially when you're young, to get enough sleep, but also when you're old. But when you're young, for your brain to develop, you should have enough sleep. It's probably related to this um, stage three slow way sleep. It's also good for our physical body. So during uh, stage three sleep, the slow way, slow way sleep, uh, our body is destroying free radicals. So it's preventing the damaging effects on our bodies from those things. So not only is it important for our brains, but it's also important for our bodies. And the research suggests that um, it, it depends on individuals, but for the most part, you can't make yourself physically tired and have more slow way sleep. So you may have known some people that sort of say, well, I'm gonna do a lot of activity today, physical activity, I'm gonna sleep really well tonight. The research suggests that it's not, not so clear. Um, but if you wanna help your slow way sleep, you should have your brain do stuff. So if you have a lot of what, and they call it intense cerebral activity, so intense thinking, not like lazy stuff. Um, so if you're doing like Candy Crush or playing some game like that, that's not intense cerebral activity. Uh, it's not really challenging to your brain. Um, but if you're challenging your brain um, and you do that quite a bit that day, that week, you're going to get good stage three slow play sleep, which will have good benefits for your cognition and also for your body with the free radical stuff I just talked about. Um, so if uh, you want to sleep, you should get your brain active. I think that's uh, almost counterintuitive, but you know, sometimes I think, I think I should sort of try to turn off my brain before I sleep. But uh, learning this biological stuff, I've been doing more of um, active stuff, um, like watching Jeopardy right before bed, for example. And I found that I'm getting a much better sleep when I do that versus if I uh, watch baseball or football right before I sleep. 
so uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, making up sleep. Uh, so um, sometimes you hear people say this. They'll say, oh, I'm, I, I'll only get two hours of sleep tonight, and I'll make it up tomorrow. I'll get 12 hours. I'll, I'll make up the time. Uh, there's a bit of um, yes and no to that. You can't make up slow wave sleep. So the stage three sleep that's really important that we just talked about, important for your cognitive learning and for your body also uh, and for your brain in terms of resting it you can't make that up if you lose it it's gone forever you can't make it up um, so that night that you only got two hours of sleep you've lost all the benefit of that stage three slowly sleep for that night in terms of learning from the day and resting your brain. You can't get it back. So slowly of sleep, you cannot make up. REM sleep, for whatever reason, you make it up. Um, so if you don't have a lot of dreams uh, one night, you might have a ton of dreams the next night. Or even it can be um, early in your sleep, let's say the first four hours, somehow you were getting up a lot uh, you were disrupting your REM sleep, you might find that you will go back to bed, you know, in the later part of your sleep, last four hours or so, and you, you might get bombarded with dreams. Have a lot of dreams, have them fast, and have them more intensely and long. Uh, this is what they call rebound phenomenon. So in terms of REM sleep, our body seems to desperately want to make it up. So whatever REM sleep we lose in a night, early in a night, We'll make it up later that night, or if we don't get enough one night, we'll make it up the next night. So REM sleep we make up, slowly sleep you can't make up. So basically there's two types of um, things going on in our different stages of our sleep. So uh, REM sleep helps us consolidate non-declarative memory. What does, what does that mean? REM sleep help, helps us process things that have to do with events in our daily life. So whether that's events um, with people that you know, or different contexts, events at your school, events at work, events with your family, events with your relationships, these types of things, the memories from them are consolidated during REM sleep. And that makes sense because remember there's some link uh, both in terms of brain activity and the content of our dreams with everyday life. And so those everyday life type of things, those patterns, those relationships that we deal with everyday life, those are being worked on during our dreams, our REM sleep. Slow wave, slow wave sleep really is about what they call declarative memories, which are uh, information, more informational things. So a good way to think about that is your school stuff. And so um, if you're trying to learn something new, you should try to make sure to have a lot of slowly, slow way sleep during that time. Uh, when I present this uh, to live classes, I always get a nice um, interesting reaction because uh, so many students don't do this. So many students cram at the last minute trying to study for exams and I'll tell you, you're shooting yourself in the foot in, in a couple of ways. I, sort of, I say not to do that because you don't want to be stressed out when you're trying to learn. You don't learn well under stress, but you're also shooting yourself in the foot in terms of how your brain works. How our brain works is we are supposed to sleep, have those nice patterns of stage three sleeps, which we should have, you know, uh, three or four of them a night. That stage three sleep helps us remember things we learned that day. So if you're cramming for exams, you're not getting enough sleep, you're not going to remember as well because you're not having that stage three sleep, those sleep cycles that night to remember that material. Um, so in terms of learning new stuff, learning information, Stage three, slowly sleep is especially important. So uh, I would say make sure you even out your sleep and allow yourself to process things from your daily life, whether those are events 
the non-declarative stuff in dreams, or whether that's information you're learning that day uh, through the stage three sleep, the slow lay of sleep. So I would recommend highly to get good sleep throughout the week uh, and don't cram. Don't lose sleep because you're actually not going to remember things very well. You're not giving your brain a chance to consolidate that information. Um, and I think that's it for this supplemental lecture. So that's a quick little uh, view of the states of consciousness with uh, sleep um, as a supplement to the dreams information. So I hope that this was um, interesting. I hope you can use this in your real life. And I'll talk to you in the next lecture.